This time, we're diving into a story set in Columbus, Ohio. We're talking about the Columbus Food Truck Festival, a place where foodies unite, but this year something sinister is on the menu. So sit back, relax, and let's get into it. Our story centers around Sarah, a 32-year-old food blogger known for her adventurous palate and knack for finding the best eats in the city. The annual Columbus Food Truck Festival was her favorite event of the year, a place where she could indulge in culinary delights and share her experiences with her followers. This year, the festival was bigger than ever, with dozens of food trucks lined up around the Seattle Mile. The weather was perfect, and the atmosphere was buzzing with excitement. Sarah arrived with her friend Josh, a fellow food enthusiast, ready to sample everything the festival had to offer. All right, Josh, let's hit the trucks, Sarah exclaimed, her camera already rolling. They started with some classic favorites, barbecue ribs, gourmet tacos, and artisanal ice cream. Everything was going great until they stumbled upon a new food truck they hadn't seen before, Shadows and Spice. The truck was sleek and black, with intricate designs etched into the metal. The smell coming from it was intoxicating, a mix of spices that made Sarah's mouth water. The line was surprisingly short, given how good it smelled. Let's check this one out, Josh suggested, already moving towards the truck. Sarah followed, intrigued. The owner of the truck was a tall, thin man with piercing blue eyes and a warm smile. His name tag read, Eli. Welcome to Shadows and Spice. What can I get for you? Eli asked, his voice smooth as honey. Sarah glanced at the menu. It was filled with exotic dishes she'd never heard of. I'll try the Shadow Burger, she said, her curiosity piqued. Josh ordered the same, and they watched as Eli expertly crafted their meals. The burgers were unlike anything they'd seen before, with black buns and a sauce that shimmered oddly. They took a bite, and the flavor exploded in their mouths. It was delicious, yet there was something unsettling about it. Sarah felt a shiver run down her spine but shrugged it off. This is amazing, she exclaimed, though she couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. As they continued to explore the festival, Sarah started to feel strange. Her vision blurred, and she felt an overwhelming sense of dread. She looked at Josh, who seemed to be experiencing the same thing. Do you feel weird? she asked, her voice shaky. Yeah, I don't know what's happening, Josh replied, his eyes wide with fear. They decided to leave the festival early and head back to Sarah's apartment. Once there, Sarah collapsed onto the couch, her mind racing. She couldn't get the image of Eli's piercing blue eyes out of her head. That night, Sarah had a nightmare. She was back at the food truck, but this time it was dark, and Eli's smile was sinister. He leaned in close and whispered, You've tasted the shadows. Now they're part of you. She woke up in a cold sweat, her heart pounding. She grabbed her phone and called Josh, but there was no answer. Panic set in, and she decided to go to his apartment to check on him. When she arrived, the door was ajar. She pushed it open and called out, Josh? There was no response. She stepped inside and found the apartment empty, but there were strange symbols drawn on the walls in what looked like black ink. Suddenly, her phone rang. It was Josh's number, but when she answered, it wasn't Josh on the other end. It was Ely. You can't escape the shadows, Sarah. They're coming for you, he said before the line went dead. Sarah's blood ran cold. She knew she had to find out what was happening. She drove back to the festival grounds, which were now deserted. The shadows and spice truck was gone, but she found a black feather on the ground where it had been parked. She picked it up, feeling a strange energy emanating from it. As she stood there, she noticed shadows moving around her even though there was no one else there. Who's there? She called out, her voice trembling. The shadows seemed to grow, enveloping her. She could hear whispers, but she couldn't make out what they were saying. Fear gripped her, and she tried to run, but the shadows held her in place. Just as she felt like she was going to be consumed by the darkness, she remembered the symbols in Josh's apartment. She quickly drew one of them on the ground with the feather, hoping it would do something. To her surprise, the shadows recoiled, and she felt the grip on her loosen. She ran to her car and sped away, 
her mind racing. She knew she had to find Josh and stop whatever was happening. She spent the next few days researching the symbols and trying to track down Eli. She discovered that shadows and spice had popped up in various cities, always leaving strange occurrences in its wake. One night, as she was poring over her notes, she heard a knock on her door. She looked through the peephole and saw Josh, looking disheveled but alive. Josh! she exclaimed, opening the door and hugging him. We have to stop him, Sarah, Josh said, his voice filled with urgency. He's using the food to bind people to the shadows. Together, they devised a plan to confront Eli and destroy the truck. They returned to the festival grounds at night, hoping to find some clue as to where he might be. As they searched, they heard a familiar voice. Looking for me? They turned to see Eli standing there, his eyes glowing with an unnatural light. The food truck appeared behind him, as if summoned by his presence. You can't stop the shadows, Eli said, his voice echoing. We have to try, Sarah replied, holding up the feather she had found. Eli laughed, but there was an edge of fear in his eyes. Sarah and Josh moved towards the truck, drawing the symbols they had learned on the ground around it. The shadows seemed to writhe in agony as they completed the symbols. Eli screamed, his form flickering between solid and shadow. With a final desperate move, Sarah threw the feather at the truck. There was a blinding flash of light, and Eli's scream was cut short. So when the light faded, the truck was gone, and the shadows had dissipated. Sarah and Josh stood there, breathing heavily, but relieved. Is it over? Josh asked, his voice shaky. I think so, Sarah replied, though she couldn't shake the feeling that they hadn't seen the last of the shadows. As they walked back to their car, Sarah glanced back one last time. In the distance, she thought she saw a figure watching them, but when she blinked, it was gone. It was just another Tuesday in Crestwood, a small town that prided itself on its absolute mediocrity. Everyone knew everyone, and everyone had something to say about everyone else. Nothing ever changed, and that was exactly how the locals liked it. But as you'll see, even the most routine days can turn into something out of a nightmare. Jenna was just finishing up her shift at the grind, the local coffee shop. It was a quaint little place with checkerboard floors and walls adorned with vintage coffee ads. I've always wondered how a place so charming could harbor any dark secrets. But then again, charm is often just a thin veneer hiding the more sinister underbelly of human nature. Anyway, Jenna had a routine. She'd close up, take a quick walk through the park, where nothing much ever happened, mind you, and then head home to her tiny apartment. That evening, she decided to stay a bit later at the grind to finish up some paperwork. It was a slow day, so she figured why not get a head start on the next morning's orders. Little did she know, that was the last thing she'd ever do without a creeping sense of dread. So, Jenna's locking up the shop, right? She's got her earbuds in, jamming to some podcast about unsolved mysteries. Ironic, right? Anyway, she's in her own world, when suddenly she hears something. It's this faint, rhythmic thud. At first, she thinks it's just the old building settling or maybe a stray cat knocking over trash cans, but as she listens more closely, it becomes clear that the sound is coming from inside the shop. Okay, now, let me pause for a second. Most people would have freaked out at this point. I mean, you're alone, it's late, and you hear a noise from inside a place you thought was empty. But Jenna's not like that. She's got this calm, almost eerie composure about her. Maybe it's because she's so used to the mundane that anything even slightly out of the ordinary just doesn't phase her. She decides to check it out. I'd say this is where the story starts to get interesting, but that's an understatement. As she walks back into the grind, the thudding gets louder, more erratic. It's coming from the back room where they store the coffee beans and other supplies. Okay, at this point, I'd be ready to bolt. But Jenna... She's got a curiosity that's either commendable or utterly reckless. She opens the door to the back room, and there it is, a large metal storage container that was definitely not there earlier. It's making the noise, vibrating slightly as if something inside is trying to get out. 
And here's where the intensity really ramps up. Jenna's face goes pale, and she just stands there for a second, frozen. What kind of a person stands frozen in terror while a metal box is vibrating like it's about to explode? Jenna, apparently. She takes a deep breath and approaches the container. She puts her hand on the lid, and it's warm, almost hot to the touch. Now, I'd like to think that Jenna's about to make a smart decision here, but she doesn't. She slowly opens the container, and inside is something that defies logic. There's no neat explanation for it, no easy way to make sense of what she sees. Just a heap of something. A mass of squirming, shifting shapes, tangled together, their forms indistinguishable from one another. And it's not just the sight that's horrifying, it's the sound. This low, guttural noise that's like a chorus of tormented souls. She stumbles back, nearly knocking over a stack of coffee sacks. In her panic, she tries to shut the container, but it's like the thing inside has a mind of its own. The lid slams shut with a deafening clang, and Jenna runs out of the shop, heart pounding. The next morning, she tells her friends about it. Of course, nobody believes her. They chalk it up to exhaustion or maybe too many horror podcasts. Classic case of the mundane dismissing the macabre. Jenna goes back to the grind, half expecting the container to be gone, but it's still there. The noise is gone, though. It's as if the thing inside had decided to be silent, biding its time. Jenna tries to ignore it, but it's like a shadow following her around. Every sound makes her jump. Every creak of the building's old frame seems to echo with a sinister intent. She's scared, but she's also stubborn. She figures she's dealt with enough nonsense in her life to back down now. Days go by, and the container remains an enigma. The noises never return, but Jenna can't shake the feeling that something terrible is waiting, lurking, just out of sight. She's convinced that the thing inside is a ticking time bomb, and it's only a matter of time before it breaks free. So here's where things get even more unsettling. One night, Jenna's walking home from work, and she sees something that makes her blood run cold. A similar metal container, just like the one from the grind, sitting abandoned in the park. The sight of it sends her into a full-blown panic. She doesn't want to investigate, doesn't want to know what's inside, but the curiosity is too much. She approaches the container cautiously, her hands trembling. She looks around. Nobody else is around. It's eerily quiet. She takes a deep breath and opens the lid. Inside, there's nothing but a note. It's handwritten, with a message that makes her freeze in her tracks. You're not the first, and you won't be the last. Beware the things you cannot see. Jenna slams the lid shut and bolts home. She's in full-blown paranoia mode now. Every sound is amplified. Every shadow seems to move. She doesn't sleep, doesn't eat much. The thing inside the container, the one she never truly saw but only heard, seems to haunt her every waking moment. Here's the kicker. She never sees that container again. It vanishes without a trace, just like the one in the grind. Jenna tries to move on, but the fear never really leaves her. It's like it's become a part of her, seeping into her daily life. So, what's the takeaway from all this? Maybe it's that the unknown is far scarier than anything you could ever see or understand. Jenna's story is a reminder that some mysteries are better left unsolved. Because sometimes, the things that go bump in the night are not the result of a bad dream, but the manifestation of our own deepest fears. And maybe, just maybe, there's a part of you that's always waiting for something to come knocking on your door, just like it did for Jenna. The world might be full of mundane routines, but lurking beneath the surface are shadows we'd be better off never uncovering. Today, I've got a story from Atlanta that will make you double-check your locks and maybe rethink your morning routine. It was a typical weekday morning in Atlanta. You know the drill. Sun shining, birds chirping, and the promise of another sweltering day. I was getting ready for work, running a bit late as usual. My buddy Dave always gave me hell for hitting the snooze button one too many times. You'll be late to your own funeral, Mark, he'd joke. Little did he know how those words would come back to haunt us. I live in a cozy little apartment in Midtown, not far from Piedmont Park. 
It's one of those neighborhoods where you know your neighbors just enough to say hi, but not enough to really know their business. And honestly, I liked it that way. I was rushing out the door with a piece of toast hanging from my mouth when I got a text from Dave. Yo, you hear about that weird stuff going on at the park? I glanced at the message, rolled my eyes, and stuffed my phone into my pocket. Dave was always talking about some conspiracy or another. The day went by like any other, boring meetings, endless emails, and the occasional coffee run to keep me sane. It wasn't until lunch that I finally got a chance to check the news. Sure enough, there were reports of strange occurrences at Piedmont Park. People claimed they'd seen shadows moving on their own, and a few even reported hearing whispers when no one was around. I couldn't help but chuckle. People have too much time on their hands, I thought, shaking my head. But the more I read, the more intrigued I became. I mean, I walk through that park almost every day. It's my shortcut to work, and I'd never noticed anything weird. That night I decided to take my usual route through the park on my way home, just to see if there was any truth to the rumors. The sun was setting, casting long shadows across the path. I popped in my earbuds, cranked up some tunes, and started walking. Everything seemed normal at first. Kids playing, joggers jogging, and couples enjoying a romantic evening stroll. But as I got deeper into the park, things started to feel off. The air grew colder, which was odd for an Atlanta evening in the middle of July. I shrugged it off, blaming my overactive imagination. As I walked past the playground, I noticed something strange. There was a swing moving back and forth, but no one was on it. I stopped and stared, trying to make sense of it. It's just the wind, I told myself, though the trees around me were eerily still. I picked up my pace, eager to get home. That's when I heard it, a faint whisper, like someone calling my name. I pulled out my earbuds and looked around. Hello? I called out, but no one answered. Get a grip, Mark, I muttered, shaking my head. I was almost out of the park when I saw her, a woman standing under a tree, her back to me. She had long, dark hair and was wearing a white dress that seemed to glow in the dim light. Hey, are you okay? I called out, taking a step toward her. She didn't move. I felt a chill run down my spine, but I couldn't just leave her there. I took another step, and that's when she turned around. Her eyes were hollow, and her face was pale as a ghost. She opened her mouth, but no sound came out. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. Suddenly, she vanished, leaving me standing there, scared out of my mind. I bolted out of the park, not stopping until I was safely inside my apartment. I locked the door, leaned against it, and tried to catch my breath. What the hell was that? I wondered, my mind racing. I grabbed my phone and called Dave. Dude, you won't believe what just happened, I said, my voice shaking. I told him everything, and he listened, surprisingly silent. Mark, you need to be careful, he finally said. I've been reading up on this stuff. There's some dark history in that park. People have gone missing, and there have been reports of strange sightings for years. Come on, Dave. You know I don't believe in that crap, I replied, though I couldn't shake the image of the woman's hollow eyes. Just promise me you'll stay out of the park for a while, he insisted. Fine, fine, I said, more to get him off my back than anything else. But deep down, I knew I'd be avoiding that park for a while. The next few days were uneventful. I took the long way to work, avoiding the park altogether. But every night, I'd hear whispers outside my window. At first, I thought it was just the wind, or maybe my neighbors. But one night, I looked outside and saw the same woman standing on the sidewalk, staring up at me. I stumbled back, my heart racing. When I looked again, she was gone. I called Dave, but he didn't pick up. I left a frantic voicemail, hoping he'd call me back soon. The whispers grew louder each night, and I could feel my sanity slipping away. I barely slept, and when I did, I had nightmares about the woman in the park. I knew I had to do something, but I didn't know what. One evening, I decided to confront my fears. I grabbed a flashlight and headed to the park. It was deserted, the playground empty, and the swings still. I walked to the tree where I'd seen the woman, my hands shaking. All right, let's get this over with, I muttered, shining my flashlight around. 
The beam of light landed on something shiny near the base of the tree. I knelt down and picked it up. It was a locket, tarnished with age. I opened it and found a faded photograph of the woman I'd seen, along with a small note. It read, Find me where the sun sets. What the hell does that mean? I wondered aloud. But I knew I had to follow the clue if I wanted to end this nightmare. The next evening, just before sunset, I returned to the park. The sky was painted in hues of orange and pink, and the air was heavy with anticipation. I walked toward the west side of the park, where the sun was dipping below the horizon. As I approached the edge of the park, I saw an old, abandoned gazebo. It looked like it hadn't been used in years, covered in ivy and decay. I climbed the steps, my heart pounding in my chest. In the center of the gazebo, I found a small, dusty box. I hesitated for a moment before opening it. Inside was another photograph of the woman, along with a key and a letter. The letter read, To end this curse, return what was taken. I pocketed the key in the photograph, trying to make sense of it all. What was taken, I wondered. And then it hit me. The locket. I pulled it out of my pocket and examined it closely. There was a tiny inscription on the back that I hadn't noticed before. In memory of Evelyn, 1932. Evelyn, I whispered. Who took your locket? I spent the next few days researching Evelyn, trying to piece together her story. I found an old newspaper article from 1932 about a young woman named Evelyn who had gone missing in the park. She was never found, and her disappearance remained a mystery. It all started to make sense. Evelyn's spirit was trapped in the park, searching for her lost locket. And somehow I had become a part of her story. With the key and the locket in hand, I returned to the park one last time. The sun was setting, casting long shadows across the path. I made my way to the old oak tree where I'd first seen Evelyn. Evelyn, I'm here to help you, I called out, holding up the locket. The air grew cold, and I could see my breath in front of me. I felt a presence behind me and turned to see Evelyn standing there, her hollow eyes filled with sadness. I'm sorry for what happened to you, I said, my voice trembling. I want to help you find peace. I placed the locket on the ground and used the key to unlock it. As the locket opened, a soft light emanated from within, enveloping Evelyn. She smiled, and for a moment I could see the young woman she once was. Thank you, she whispered, her voice filled with gratitude. And then she was gone. I stood there, stunned, as the air grew warm again. The whispers stopped, and the park felt normal. I knew that Evelyn had finally found peace. As I walked home, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief. The nightmare was over, and I had played a part in helping a lost soul find her way. But I also knew that I would never forget those hollow eyes and the chilling whispers that had haunted me. And so, dear listeners, the next time you walk through Piedmont Park, remember Evelyn's story. Be kind to the spirits that may still linger, and always keep an eye out for the things that go bump in the night. Thanks for tuning in to Southern Spooks. If you've got your own eerie tales to share, hit us up. And remember, stay aware, stay safe, and always trust your instincts. You never know what might be lurking in the shadows. Thank you.